I can just start, yeah. Yeah, as in now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, my name is James Smith. Um, I teach about climate change and health in the university. Uh, and uh, I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, um, Dr. Nick Watts. Um, I've known Nick for several years now. Um, and I can't think of anyone better to talk to us about climate change and health. Um, as you'll soon discover, uh, Nick's from Australia. And um, that's where he trained in medicine. But he uh, very quickly came over to England and started working on uh, climate change. And he's perhaps best known for um, all the work he's done on the Lancet Commissions on Climate Change and Health. Um, so those were published in 2009 and 2015. And they really are the defining sort of publications that we go to as health professionals to understand climate change and health. Um, he followed that by um, setting up and now running the Lancet Countdown on Climate Change and Health, which is a sort of stock take that regularly looks at how we're doing in relation to climate change and health. But um, it's never seemed like one job is enough for Nick. So um, in, in the period over the last sort of 10 years, um, when I've known about his work, he's been an advisor to the WHO. He um, helped run the Global Climate and Health Alliance, which, was, which is the um, umbrella organization bringing together NGOs working on the climate and health, um, on climate and health. Um, and he was the um, director of the UK Health Alliance for Climate Change, um, which is where, which does advocacy for the Royal Colleges um, on climate change. He's also recently been um, uh, installed as chair of the Net Zero Task Force for the NHS in England. Um, so he's starting to get more involved in healthcare, um, climate change and healthcare. So I don't think there's anyone better to talk about climate change and health from a global perspective and also give us some insight into the role of public health and the health sector as we head towards COP26. So, uh, Dr. Nick Watts. Hi. <laughs> Hi, hello. Um, James said you would quickly discover that I was Australian. I hope by my second hello, it's been apparent to everyone. Any Australians in the room? Where about you from? Melbourne. Melbourne, okay. Well, I'm from Perth. <laughs> Anyone from New Zealand in the room? Good. <laughs> we won't have any, pro well, we won't have many problems. My name is Nick. My name is Nick. Um, I am a doctor. I'm from Australia. Um, I work in health and climate change. I've done it for the last sort of, decade or so, doing a bit of clinical work on the side here and there. Um, worked at the international level, like James said, with the GCHA, the Global Climate and Health Alliance, with the World Health Organization, um, with the UK Health Alliance, uh, now with the NHS, a little bit with, um, with the Lancet. Um, the entire time I've done that, I have been told that no one can understand my accent, no one can understand the way I pronounce the word data. Um, there's <laughs> absolutely nothing I can do about that. I'm so sorry. Um, but I'm also sick of being told. So. Um, but we don't have any Kiwis here, so I think we should be okay with that. We have three and a half hours. Three and a half hours. We have three and a half hours. James is nodding. Um, and then time for like a 10 minute break. And then I think we will come back and talk for maybe, like, not too much after that, like another 45 minutes or so. Um, we have as long as you guys would like. Um, I am going to talk through the links between health and climate change, um, both the impacts of climate change on human health and what the response looks like, what it looks like from a health system perspective in terms of adaptation, what it looks like from all of those other sectors and broader determinants of health, the ways we can get it right and the ways that we can get it wrong. Halfway through med school, I had a, I think he was probably a neurosurgeon who said, I'm going to be talking for the next three and a half hours, um, but he wasn't joking. Um, he was going to be talking for the next three and a half hours, but very generously he said, I'm going to give you the three things you need to remember for the exam so that you can all fall asleep. Um, and I thought that was quite a, good, uh, quite a good device. The impacts of climate change, they are unequivocal, they are irreversible, and they are affecting populations around the world, every single person around the world today. 2020, not 2050, not 2100. We've known this not for 10 years or 20 years, we've known this for 30 years. And broadly, the world has done nothing to respond. At best, we've kept things at bay. At best, we've kept things flat. 
say that not to discount the incredible work that has happened over those 30 years, but it has happened and has been fighting against some pretty, uh, pretty remarkable forces on the other side. So we have impact, delay, and just in the last five years, I think probably since 2015, probably since the Paris Agreement, I think we have started to see some really, really exciting trends that five years before that we wouldn't have even thought were possible. I call them our sort of glimmers of hope, our reasons for very cautious optimism, but I think we see exciting trends in areas that are most important for public health and for climate change around energy transitions for coal-fired power, transport, and around the healthcare sector. And so I think we're going to talk through those impact, delay, optimism. Anyone going to go home? Anyone going to go to sleep? You're all very, I guess we have some people online that are probably already asleep. Um, you're all very polite. Does that sound okay? Is that what everyone expected? James? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. correct, good, great. Okay. Everything I do, I'm going to talk about drawing on data from this thing. Um, this thing is uh, the Lancet Countdown. We do a pretty simple thing. Once a year, we put a finger on the pulse of the planet and we track 41 different indicators of the relationship between public health and climate change. Anything from the extremes of heat, climate suitability for, different, uh, for the transmission of different vectorial and waterborne diseases, through to what's happening in coal-fired power, what happens in the air pollution that comes out of that coal-fired uh, coal power plant, what happens to the hearts, the lungs, the brains, out the other side of that, and then what happens to the healthcare system that has to pay for the consequences of that coal-fired power plant. We track all of that every year. Um, it's a pretty simple thing. We, we do it, we think, because climate change is the biggest global health threat um, that we face today. Biggest global health threat of the 21st century, we thought back in 2009, and we still, we still think that. Um, so obviously, in response to the biggest global health threat, coronavirus, um, we, we did what you know, any, uh, any sensible collaboration would do. We got a bunch of academics, and we put them in a basement. Um, we started where all good research starts. Um, really, as far as I can tell, we're only, uh, the only place in this country where good research starts. University College London. We found a few friends in Sweden and in Beijing. And that took us a couple of years to build up some partnerships there. Um, we found a couple of stragglers in London, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who we've been trying to get rid of since then. Um, uh, an Australian group, the University of Sydney and the World Health Organization, and we grew and we grew, and pretty quickly we needed a bigger basement. So in response to the world's biggest global health threat, we grabbed some academics, we did what academics do, we produced uh, reports, which seems like so far it's going well. And then with those reports, we um, produced a lot of graphs. Quite a few graphs, really. A um, lot of data in the countdown. Um, all of it is publicly available online. You can find it all there. You can go and disaggregate down to the national level, to the local level. In the reports, we normally present things at the global or at the WHO regional level. Um, that's because the Lancet insists on a word count, which we think is ridiculous. Um, one thing I would like you to pay attention is the axis along the bottom there. Um, for the most part, when we're talking today, we're going to be talking with axes that end in 2018, 2019, 2020. We're trying to track what's happening around the world today. Yes, climate change is going to have some effects in 2050 and 2100, but if we had to wait to see what those effects were, we'd be too late to respond. And so everything we do, we're talking up to present day, and then we place the rest of it in context and create some graphs that make literally no sense to anyone at all. <laughs> okay. Number one. The human symptoms of climate change, they are unequivocal, they are irreversible, they are affecting populations around the world today, every population, every person around the world today. We think we're now at the point with some of this evidence that we can start to talk about a full life cycle analysis. We can start to talk about sort of the impacts of climate change on the life of a child born today and track that child's life the whole way through. Average life expectancy is 71. If you want to do a bad job of public health, you can just track that forward. Um, that kid born today, experiences a four degree world. Now, we have absolutely no idea what that looks like in terms of public health uh, sort of terms. We know roughly what it looks like climactically. 
we've seen it before. The Earth has sort of experienced four degrees before. It looked pretty drastically different to how it is. But what we do know for sure is that the NHS, when it was being built in the Australian healthcare system and the Indian and the Chinese healthcare systems, they were not expecting to have to face a changing climate like this. And they were not expecting to have to face uh, things that were changing that rapidly. In fact, they were built with the idea that the climate was stable, because the climate used to be stable. And it turns out that when you start to move things rapidly like that, you realize that the environment is not just a thing that you sort of, you know, take a train out, sort of an hour and a half to go and visit if you're from London. It's actually everywhere, um, in the food, the water, the air. And so we spend our time tracking and working through this sort of stuff. Um, some of it gets pretty upsetting. So we spend a lot of time talking about the extremes of heat. Extremes of heat are some of the more direct, immediate, not necessarily visible, because heat waves are often silent killers, but some of the more direct, immediate impacts of climate change that we see on human health. We have some really great studies now, detection attribution studies, that let us isolate the influence of climate change on specific heat waves, specific events that you start to see. We see the fingerprints of climate change on that enormous heat wave that everyone talks about back in 2003 in Western Europe. 70,000 excess deaths, 2003, yes. Then again in 2007, and again in 2010, then three times in 2011, 2012, 13, 14, 17, 18, 19. Climate change at every single major heat wave in Europe over the last decade has had its fingerprints either increasing the duration, the likelihood of the damn event happening, or the intensity of the event as it happened. And as we know, what matters the most when we're looking at heat waves is the duration. It matters a heck of a lot if it's three days or five days, because that extra two days is what tips people over the edge, and that's when an exacerbation of congestive heart failure turns into full-blown heart failure and APO. Yeah. So when we track this, we track exposure of extremes of heat up to present day. We see an additional 220 million vulnerable people around the world exposed. Vulnerable people, people aged over 65 years of age, people with pre-existing kidney, heart conditions, um, uh, the urban poor, people that lack the ability to adapt, lack access to air conditioning, or uh, if you're not going to cool air, at least move air to proper ventilation. And that's concerning, but I suppose what is even more concerning is, is some of the insidious, uh, sort of insidious parts of, uh, of, of these heat impacts. We see 133 billion work hours lost, rising temperatures across the world. Um, these numbers are increasing at pretty alarming rates. It's very clear where those rates are happening. They're happening in places where you have a hot climate, a dense population, and you have a lot of people working in agriculture and in labor, people working outdoors who don't have, um, don't have a, a sort of lovely built, insulated building like this. Um, those effects, I think, are the things that we see immediately. Um, the ones that you sort of start to track through that I, I think we should be even more concerned about, and the ones that really sort of tend to keep us up at night, are when we track through to see what climate change does, not directly to human health, but when it interacts with some of the determinants that we depend on, when it interacts on, interacts with crops, interacts with sort of clean, potable water, or indeed with vector-borne disease. And so tracking here, what we do is we ask a couple of clever satellites to help us out. We go and figure out where the world's crops are. We track five crops, maize, winter wheat, soybeans, rice, and spring wheat. Four graphs looks nicer than five graphs, I think. Um, we track where those, those are in the world. We have a pretty good sense of what kind of temperature conditions you need to, uh, in order to sort of optimize, optimize their growth. Um, we see a global yield potential decline of somewhere between 2 to 6% um, around the world. Uh, in quite a few countries now, 36 countries, that yield potential, so the potential sort of being affected either by, usually by a heat shock, but potentially by a precipitation shock. Um, we see 36 of those countries now following with actual yield declines, including Australia. Um, Australia's actual yield, decline, uh, yield is declining, and that's because the climate has been so unfavorable for the last 12 years or so. Um, as it declines, for Australia, that's not gonna result in a food security issue because we are a wealthy country, because we have access, deep access to regional food markets, but it is going to have a pretty profound impact on the mental health of the farmers across Australia who built their entire lives and indeed for generations have built their lives um, around having that stable climate. So that's Australia. 
but then there are other parts of the world that maybe aren't quite so wealthy and so can't, uh, can't import that food when they, when they run into that shock. Or if they did have the cash, don't have the access to the regional food markets. And again, you see them exactly where you'd expect to see them, but that's the, that's the sort of situation that we get worried about. Tracking from climate shock to yield potential to yield to price shift to, uh, to sort of food in a kid's mouth is pretty difficult. Our friends at, friends, some people that live near UCL at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, is anyone here from LSHDM? Good. <laughs> Our friends at LSHDM um, do a really great job of at least attempting that and putting some bookends on it. They reckon roughly by 2050, if we continue just on business as usual, heading towards that four degree world, in sub-Saharan Africa, we expect to see another 11 million children under the age of five malnourished as a result of these climate shocks. Across Southeast Asia, about nine million additional children under the age of five. For the clinicians in the room, people that work in nutrition, kids under the age of five that are malnourished and stay malnourished, that has some pretty severe consequences on their life going the whole way forward. Um, it has consequences not just for their health, but then for the health of their families, for their ability to, their ability to sort of generate household income, um, and indeed macroeconomic effects as well. So we worry about heat. We worry about food security. We worry about infectious disease. At the most basic level, where you see an infectious disease affected in some way by temperature or by water, by precipitation, we expect that climate change will have an effect. Whether that effect will be positive or negative, whether it will just shift something from left to right, um, I suppose is still yet to be studied. At a couple of levels, for dengue fever, through Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, we have a pretty good sense that globally we're expecting to see a heck of a lot more dengue as a result of climate change. That tracks through for some of the other things that, uh, that these two mosquitoes carry, right? So they carry all sorts of nasty stuff, chikungunya. Um, they carry Zika virus. The WHO has some really interesting data they're just about to release looking at the particularly, or unusually as they put it, fierce El Nino that came just before the epidemic from Zika. They don't make the connection to why that El Nino was particularly fierce, um, but in some ways they don't have to. Up to present day, we see somewhere between sort of a seven to a nine percent, it depends on the year you ask us, but somewhere between a seven to a nine percent increase in the climate suitability for these infections to transmit. The, the, for dengue, it's the most rapidly uh, growing infection in the world. Um, it's growing, I think, we can say for three reasons, urbanization, trade, a changing climate. So we see that, but then we also see these effects in malaria and the Anopheles mosquito. Um, mostly concentrated in, uh, in the mosquito and the vector moving up and down the highlands across sub-Saharan sub Africa and the shifts there. But Australia now has started preparing for endemic malaria. It's a problem we didn't used to have to think about. Um, we didn't used to have to think about how we're going to make sure that we have those surveillance programs in place up the northeast coast of Queensland. We didn't used to have to think about how we had the health literacy amongst our population to know that if you had a fever that came every couple of days, you probably needed to get to a doctor or a nurse pretty quickly. And we didn't have to train up our health professionals to make sure that they were able to recognize that, or at least we didn't when I went to med school. <laughs> I should say the other thing we do very, very well is produce diagrams that make absolutely no sense. Um, this is not, not even our best. Um, <laughs> it does an okay job of trying to capture some of those health effects of climate change from the top down to the bottom. Um, we end up talking about the extremes of heat, yes, and the sequelae the whole way through the system. We end up talking about extreme weather events in terms of flood, drought, what that does to physical injury and direct and to death, um, what it does to sort of crop yield, water, in, uh, water insecurity, um, waterborne diseases and mental health out the other side. Um, we spend a lot of our time talking about air pollution. We spend a lot of our time talking about vector-borne disease. This graph, this diagram, I think is, um, is broadly useless. Um, except I like it for one reason. I like it because it does a good job of reminding me that the thing that we're really worried about is not heat or not just food security or not just infectious disease spreads. What we're really worried about is the multi-hit scenario. What we're really worried about is that climate change correlates previously uncorrelated risks. And so a flood that used to come once every 200 years 
that came in 2011 and covered one fifth of the landmass of Pakistan that caused a heck of a lot of trouble in terms of wiping out crops for a country that is doing pretty well in a whole bunch of things, but isn't actually particularly well integrated into a regional food market. That then manages to flood and encircle hospitals, and that would be okay, except Pakistan learned how to build hospitals from the United Kingdom. So when the power center went out and local water stations were unable to pump water to the hospitals, that would be fine, but because we learned to, they learned to build, build hospitals in the UK, all of those generators were in the basement, and so they flood as well. And so now you have a hospital with an already sick population, a country that has a fifth of its land mass underwater and has had that for about a month and a half, and you're trying to evacuate the hospital, but you can't because all of the roads have been flooded out as well. And so over time, Pakistan gets over that, um, but it does have now a malnourished population as a result of that. It does have the spread of waterborne disease from the breakdown of sanitation systems, and it has had a health system that's taken a bit of a knock and then that flood comes back even more fierce six years later and covers a quarter of the landmass of Pakistan. And so suddenly flood is correlating with waterborne disease and infectious disease and is wearing away at what should be an anchor institution, what should be a health system that has the ability to sort of form the basis of you know, a country or a community's resilience. It's wearing away at that resilient capacity. It's that multi-hit scenario, I think, that probably keeps us up the most at night because climate change isn't just one of these things, it's all of these things at different times when you least expect it, correlating things that previously used to be uncorrelated. The health impacts of climate change, they are unequivocal, they are irreversible, and they're affecting populations around the world today. We've known about this. I think I was in a good mood maybe when we wrote this slide. For three decades, not two decades, let's ignore that. We've known about this for three decades, and so far we have broadly done nothing. When we look at health system adaptation, we go around the world and we ask countries, ministries of health, how are you guys doing in terms of your response to climate change? 51 of them, 51 countries in the world have a plan in place. They have a national health adaptation plan in place. They vary pretty dramatically. Um, Bolivia's is sort of, is pretty short. It's about two and a half pages. Um, and it spends a lot of time talking about how capitalism is evil. Um, we were reading that today. Uh, some of the wealthy countries, some of the wealthy countries out there, the United Kingdom, Australia, the United States, they have a pretty detailed plan, a couple of hundred pages. Um, that's fine, 51's not terrible, not great. What's concerning is what happens when you get a little bit further down and you start saying, okay, well, how are you guys doing in terms of your implementation? 24, because we were feeling generous, um, only six uh, are in the high category there. So the rest of those guys are at least moderate implementation. Now, this is countries self-reporting their data, so let's take all of that with a pinch of salt. Of that, only 17 of them have some budget going to, going to health system adaptation. This is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. I think 17 countries probably isn't quite enough. If we turn to mitigation, we turn to efforts to reduce emissions. This is another one of our incredibly unhelpful diagrams. It has two axes, um, uh, two y axes rather. Um, ignore the bar plot in the back. Just look at the, look at the line plot. Broadly, it's tracking carbon intensity of the global energy system. It's tracking that from a long way back into the past, but we think we have pretty good data from starting about sort of 1985, a little bit later than that. What you see, if you look closely, is you can see North and Western Europe with the stars there, the asterisks, has been coming down. It's been doing an okay job, moving fairly slowly, but it's been doing an okay job of decreasing the carbon intensity of its energy system. So is the United States. If we track this through one more year, it jumps up a little bit, which is encouraging. Um, but we are seeing some progress there, slower than you would want to see. We are seeing some progress. At the same time, we are seeing around the world, Southeast Asia and South Asia, those two trends there are dominated almost entirely by India and by China. We're seeing an enormous increase, or we have historically seen an enormous increase in the construction of coal-fired power plants as those countries have developed. Um, lifting many, many people hundreds and hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Incredibly positive effect, but at a very, very negative price. As a result of that, that little, <laughs> the most important line in the entire graph, which you almost can't see, 
um, the black dotted line there that has just remained basically flat. Over the last 30 years, the carbon intensity of the global energy system has remained flat. The intensity has remained the same. Carbon accumulates and population has increased, and so the bar plot at the back there shows us CO2 emissions going up. We've known about this for about 30 years. Out of interest, of the OECD countries, every single OECD country has managed to decrease the intensity of its system over those 30 years. Do you know which country hasn't? One country, one OECD country. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a problem. A lot of this stuff, a lot of what we've been talking about has been a problem for high but middle income countries. It's a big world out there. Almost 3 billion people live without access to clean cooking fuels and technologies. As a result of that, we see 3.7 million deaths from indoor air pollution around the world. Um, it is the single largest uh, cause of under five childhood pneumonia. Um, sorry, deaths from under five childhood pneumonia. Um, that's concerning. What to me is more concerning is that the trend is not moving. It's basically staying the same in terms of access to, uh, to sort of clean, clean energy within the household. Um, if you look at this, not just in terms of the fuel that's being used, but you look at the technology as well as the ventilation that the technology and the fuel is sitting in, you actually see things are going backwards a little bit. Um, uh, in some countries, they're developing, moving too quickly without the right policies in place. Um, you're seeing indoor air pollution worse and not improve. So, how's everyone feeling? Sorry. Impact. Human symptoms of climate change, they're unequivocal, irreversible. We've known about them for 30 years and we have not done an enormous amount of delay. Just in the last five years, I think we've started to see a trend. A pretty exciting trend for two reasons, partly for climate change, partly because we're pretty concerned about the fact that carbon emissions are shooting up and there are health impacts there. But also because, as it turns out, when you go and grab, sorry, this is one of our particularly helpful um, diagrams. As it turns out, when you go and take all the stuff you want to do to respond to climate change, um, and you get an engineer and an economist and a lawyer and a philosopher, and you put them in the room, you force them in a room with a doctor, and you say, what do you want to do to respond to climate change? And they say, phase out coal. And you say, well, OK. And we've got to stop people using cars. And we've got to make sure that we're consuming less red meat. It's terrible. A doctor looks at that and goes, oh, great. Cleaner air, more physical activity, healthier diets. It turns out that the vast, vast majority of what you want to do to respond to climate change, if you do it right, it has these enormous impacts, enormous health benefits. Um, those health benefits out the other side, if you're enlightened enough to think through this, uh, not you guys, if, uh, if a government department is enlightened enough to think through this, they will result in cost savings for the health system. We have a fantastic example in Poland that we've seen just a year or two ago. Shut down a coal-fired power plant, admissions to the local emergency department for exacerbations of COPD and of asthma, they dropped by about 11%. Um, they dropped within about three months. For a while, people tried to figure out what the hell was going on. Just the reduction in the emissions for the surrounding area around that coal plant, that, play, that paid for the replacement of all the energy that you needed to put in place. It turns out that when you consider the broader health benefits and when you consider the cost savings that come to a healthcare system, particularly around air pollution, it covers most of the initial costs that you want to put in place. The EU knows that, and that's why in their new green plan, um, they are focusing primarily on things they can do to, to reduce air pollution because they know they have an enormous bill out the other side because of the air pollution that comes and they see an enormous opportunity. So I said optimism, hey? Three sectors. Number one, power generation. <laughs> promise, I promise you this is optimistic. <laughs> you see the triangles there? I think, have I cut the key off? No, it's up the top. Triangles there, we obscure it a little bit. Um, oh no, we don't, we just say China. It is China. Um, the triangles there are uh, China flying up. Two things I think are notable there. One, God, it's impressive how rapidly China was able to increase its total primary energy supply for coal. That's what's on the y-axis there, total primary energy supply for coal. Over an incredibly short period of time, they managed to dwarf large parts of the world. What's even more impressive is they managed to stop. 2013, we started to see, we started to see sort of the acceleration um, turn around and we started to see it decline. 
This diagram here, this goes up to 2018. We haven't published this yet because we haven't fit, fully written it, but we have finished the analysis. It drops by a pretty significant amount. Um, and then that's really encouraging. So you see it flatten off there for a year or two, but that, that sort of reversal down, back down again, is something that I think 10 years ago, no one would have thought was even possible when it came to a country the size of China. And we are seeing this all the way around the world. 40 or so, 42, I think, countries have joined the Powering Past Coal Alliance, led by the United Kingdom, led by Canada, um, trying to, uh, saying unilaterally, simply because it's bad for climate change, it's bad for public health, we are not going to invest in coal as a future for our, uh, future for our, um, for our national energy mix. It's really encouraging. Ten years ago, coal represented somewhere between 30 and 40 percent, depending on the day, um, of the UK's national energy mix. As of today, it was 4 percent. Um, it'll vary day after day, but that's a really encouraging shift. And as it shifts, and if you track it through, you can start to see that some of those benefits are, are real. So Europe wasn't even really trying in 2015 and 2016 to reduce its air pollution, but it managed to. It had a couple of clever policies in place. We see a very, very small reduction in deaths from air pollution and morbidity from air pollution from 2015 to 2016. What we then track through is an enormous saving, 5.2 billion euro. And that's, uh, that's 5.2 billion euro just in terms of uh, healthcare costs. It's not in terms of what they would have gained, uh, gained from sort of having a more productive or a healthier workforce. That's what they managed to do without even really trying. We're kind of excited because this year's data that we have, we haven't finished looking at. This year's data we have goes 18 and 19. And we know that in 17, 18, 19, Europe was really trying to decrease their air pollution. The other area I think we should be excited about is in transport. We should be excited about this because electric vehicles weren't supposed to reach cost parity with their non-electric counterparts until 2036. It happened about two and a half years ago. The markets sort of took hold of that. They became far, far cheaper than anyone thought they possibly would. There's still an enormous amount of work to do, but it is starting to hockey stick. Be optimistic, I think, but do pay attention to the y-axis there. Um, these, are, these are absolute figures, not relative figures. And if you go and take a look at what's happening in terms of the rest of fuel use for transport, you'll see it's not quite as encouraging as this graph might suggest. But it is moving much, much, much faster than anyone thought it possibly would. Than some of our wildest dreams when we were sort of dreaming some of this stuff up 10, 20, 10, 20 years ago. Um, it has is, it is really taken off. The NHS uh, is ready to announce, it'll have a press release out in a week or two, um, that it thinks it's produced the world's first electric ambulance. It's ready to road test out of ground London. How exciting is that? Really, really impressive. Um, when the NHS moves, if there's one thing this country can still do, it's convince the rest of the world that it knows how to, how to deliver healthcare. I know from living in Australia and training in Australia, we follow whatever the NHS does and countries around the world do as well. And that's why I think I am most excited about this part. We're starting to see change in healthcare systems all the way around the world. So we've talked about power generation, we've talked about transport, and those are important for air pollution and for physical activity and the health benefits that come out the other side. But I don't think we quite expected this. 2008, the Climate Change Act comes into force in the United Kingdom. It's an incredibly powerful piece of legislation. No other country around the world has anything like it. There are lots and lots of problems, and we can complain about them a lot, but God, at least we have it. At that moment, the NHS creates something called the Sustainable Development Unit, based out here in Cambridge. They're an incredibly powerful, incredibly clever, committed bunch of people who have been working tirelessly to reduce the NHS's emissions over the last decade. They have managed to do that by 18.5%. An 18.5% reduction over the last decade on the background of a 24% increase in activity. The NHS has not done less stuff, it's done more stuff. It's just done it better. They've done that while saving a couple of billion pounds every year, and they've done that while improving patient outcomes and while improving customer, they say customer, patient satisfaction and staff satisfaction. That's exciting. What's even more exciting is this man here, 25th of January, he turns around and says, well, 18.5% impressive, and the government seems to think that it wants to get to a net zero target by 2050. I don't think that's quick enough. 
And he turns around and he says he's going to form a task force to, to figure out how the NHS can get to net zero well before the government target. Precisely when that's going to be, I don't know, but it's going to be well before 2050. Um, some of the changes that we started to see across the healthcare system, they're really, really exciting. Um, it didn't quite make headline news, but in the GP contract that has just been finalised, the standard contract that the NHS signs with all of its GPs, um, it has fundamentally shifted its procurement and purchasing requirements around uh, metered dose inhalers and some of, the, some of the accelerants there. It thinks probably not over 15 years like it was previously projected, probably over three or four years, it's going to be able to go from about 82% um, of those sort of polluting metered dose inhalers down to about 20% at a really, really rapid rate. Um, it caused a lot of trouble. Um, AstraZeneca had a lot to say about that. Um, and then they pretty quickly saw the writing on the wall um, because when an organization the size of the NHS, half a billion pound a day moves, the rest of the world takes notice. Impact, delay, optimism. The health symptoms, the human symptoms of climate change, they're unequivocal, they're irreversible, they're affecting populations around the world today. We've known about this for 30 years, and we've not done an enormous amount. And just recently in the last five years, I think we have a couple of reasons that we should be hopeful. We've got to be able to hold on to something. The last thing I want you guys to remember, my fourth message. Whether or not the world moves from climate change as where we started the biggest global health threat of the 21st century to the biggest global health opportunity, whether or not we take advantage of the reductions in air pollution, the increases in physical activity, the healthier diets available, whether or not we transition, it's not about the technology, it's not about the economics or the finance. If you go and ask an engineer, What's wrong? Is solar, power, is solar power no good? They'll say, no, no. In fact, it's now cost competitive with coal in every single country in the world. It used to be that it wasn't with every country. Every single country in the world, solar power is now cost com competitive. You take a 15-year view. It's fine. Coal, pl coal plants last for 80 years. Is it an economic question? Well, no, we've answered that, haven't we? Because we know that if you take that broader perspective, the EU is interested in some of this stuff, mainly because it saves money mainly because it turns out that when you consider the health impacts, the health benefits of that response, you end up investing in communities and healthy populations. Some of the best things you can do to adapt to climate change are not climate change specific, they're health system strengthening, poverty reduction. It's not a financial question either. There's plenty of money to go around. The cost of this is not that great. The money's just in the wrong place. We've just got to move it into a different place. Whether or not we move from climate change as the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, the response to climate change as the biggest global health opportunity, I think now is entirely a political one. This is a possible problem to solve. And that's why considering things in terms of the health implications of climate change is so important. No one cares about parts per, uh, parts per million of CO2 equivalents that they can't see or conceptualize. They don't care necessarily about 2100, and they definitely don't care about polar bears in New Zealand mostly because the polar bears are in New Zealand and no one cares about the New Zealanders. <laughs> what we care about, what we understand, what we respond to uh, is human. It's about childhood asthma. It's about malnutrition. It's about the kid standing next to you, not the kid a couple of thousand kilometers away. And you know, we can debate all sorts of things around whether that's right or wrong. But I think what the health argument really offers here is an opportunity to collapse the temporal scale, collapse the time difference, collapse the geospatial difference, make everything sort of local, and make us understand that this is human, that it's urgent, that it's tangible. And that, I think, is why I'm encouraged by this statement, because we've increasingly seen health professionals all the way around the world respond in a way that, oh, God, it's so impressive. Some of the stuff that the NHS is doing there is incredible. Some of the stuff that the Royal Colleges in the United Kingdom are doing, and the whole way around the world. And that's my hopefully slightly optimistic end and conclusion. But thank you very, very much for having me, Gus.
OK, I've had the thumbs up. So does anyone have any questions? We've got some roving microphones. So if you wait for the microphone, um, that would be great. Should we start at the front here? I should say, I saw lots of frowns of dissent while I was talking, so I hope there are some vociferous and you know, angry questions. Fol following <laughs> up your last point about the political, yeah, yeah. your talk was in f full of graphs, <laughs> which as a scientist I can relate to. And they, you know, it's real evidence, it's real scientific evidence. But clearly, moving on from there, the last few years in politics have shown that scientific evidence doesn't necessarily take. Yeah. You must have learned some lessons about how to get across the seriousness of where we are and the implications of it. Mm -hmm. um, are there any lessons you can share with us other than digging up Trinity's grass? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's digging up Trinity's grass? Uh, la last week, um, Extinction Rebellion dug up the grass in front of Trinity College. Am I allowed to say I love that? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, sure. I, I, I don't know if I have... Um, I don't know if I have advice, but I certainly have things that we've done wrong in the past, ways that we've messed up, messed up the communications, because we've been, I mean, James, you and I have been doing this for 15, mm. 20 years, for, for a long time. You for longer than me. Um, I don't think it's 20 years. I'm not that mate, old. Mate, <laughs> I've been doing this work. <laughs> um, the first thing we did wrong was we kept talking about 2100. Uh, we, we, in our 2015, 2009 paper, all of our data, all our evidence was 2100, and we had this... Um, fairly angry rear admiral who we invited in for one of our papers uh, to help us with some of this stuff. And he was sort of providing some policy input. And he said, people don't care, mate. People, no one cares about 2100. And so we said, OK, fine. How about we do a 10-year view? And he said, you're not listening. They don't care. And we said, fine, we'll do five years. And he started banging his fist on the table. I think he actually broke the table. Um, <laughs> do you know Neil Morissetti? The, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he was right. No one cared about five years, ten years. It was outside of the political cycle. People cared about what was happening today, and they cared about a historical view. It made the science really, really tough. Talking about climate change in 2019 is a really tough thing to do, and you see that we have to come up with some pretty clever ways of being able to launch off into that discussion. It's much easier to talk about projections and modelling out the other side. Talking about present day is pretty complex. Um, uh, but that was, I think, the first thing that we had to, had to do. The second thing we had to do was realise that climate change could not only be an issue about polar bears. It could no, not only be an environmental issue, it had to be an issue that was a issue of faith, an issue of local communities and cities. Um, uh, it had to be a issue for poverty, for gender equality, a, a health issue. And so we had to, they're often referred to as sort of new voices, these sort of new entrants into the climate change space that have showed up, I think, probably since the failure in 2009, since COP15, to really sort of step in and say, no, no, this isn't just an environmental issue, it's much, much more than that. And then I think the last thing that we got wrong and are trying to get better at is we are so earnest. Um, scientists, uh, partly because of some of the history of the IPCC and some of the stuff that it's gone through, is so terrified of being called up for not being exactly, exactly, exactly precise. And I appreciate that because it has meant that we've got some incredible data and science that we can draw on. But I think we have more than enough to speak with a little more confidence. Medicine has a great, does a great job of risk communication. Um, uh, if a patient asks, will this cigarette kill me? A doctor doesn't say, well, statistically, it's very, very complex. It may, it may not. It, you know, um, here, shall I show you a couple of the studies and then some of the studies on the other side as well and we'll have a long debate and then we'll... A doctor just says, yeah, absolutely, idiot. <laughs> I, I think that's an Australian doctor. Right. <laughs> Um, I think we need to get better at that. I think risk communication is something we have to get a lot better at. Um, we also need to start talking less about the negatives and more about the positives, more about the vision of the world we want to head towards, the fact that it's a pretty good place, um, the fact that a lot of our responses, they align with a lot of our public health imperatives. Those are the four things I think we got wrong. Can I ask you a follow-up? So the, the, you did that with the Lancet commissions. You know, the first one was about the threat and the, the mm. front cover was about the threat and the second one was about this great opportunity we could have. Mm. And that sort of it felt like you were doing what you just said about pivoting to a more optimistic message. But I don't know, I still struggle with how to find the right balance. And I know with the, the Lancer commissions, you work with um, Hugh Montgomery on that. And I always felt Hugh in his communication was, was far more, sort of, it felt a bit more brutal. I don't know if I should say <laughs> that. But you know, far more, it's sort of honest and blunt. And this is a threat to life and this is awful. And, and there's this spectrum of people who communicate about this who somehow soften that message and do more optimistic. Mm. And, how do you find the right balance with that? 
I don't know. I know I get it wrong every time. I know that roughly my, so I'm about to say what my intention is and then reveal that I got it clearly wrong. I think we should roughly spend 30% of our time talking about the impacts and 70% of our time talking about the solutions. We should be solutions focused. We've got to alarm. You've got to make sure that people understand why this is urgent, why we've got to be talking about today, not 2050. But you've got to immediately rescue. And that alarm and rescue, I sort of like to think 30, 70 is a nice arbitrary, I picked a number, a nice arbitrary number. Um, I get it wrong a lot. Hugh disagrees with me and, with me and thinks you need about 107% of negative. Um, has anyone seen Hugh Montgomery present before? Mm. He will tell you about the number of Hiroshima bombs per second um, that climate change is adding to the atmosphere in terms of, yeah, all of his stuff is as, about as extreme as you can possibly imagine. It does get people's attention mm. though. Yeah. I find it just leaves you sitting there going, oh my God, if it's that bad, there's, there's, there's nothing I could do. Yeah. And so, you know, what the, what's the point of that? Um, I, I think, I think I'm, I'm asking the question because I feel I'm a bit tentative sometimes and I'm like reluctant to use the word climate change kills people you know mm. if I write that sentence in a paper I'm giving to someone about climate change mm. it feels like that should be edited to, that's not how we talk in you know in, in organizations about and 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 yet I feel like I do want to talk like that so I don't know it's yeah. interesting I, I I mean you know the, the the medium the audience the message the messenger matters enormously mm. um one of the most powerful things I saw um Helen Stokes Lampard back when she was mm. chair of RC of the College of GPs um, she was getting a hard time on the Today program. Um, and I had the pleasure of sitting in the studio with her that morning as she was sort of talking and they kept saying, well, listen, why are you talking, why are you here talking to me about climate change? What does a doctor know? What does a GP know about climate change? You know, come on, don't you have patients to, patients to deal with? And she eventually got sort of pushed into the back, uh, put, pushed, pushed up against the wall and she sort of turned around and said, what I know as a doctor is that climate change is killing my patients. And he tried to sort of step in and she just sort of stared at him and said, killing my patients. Um, and instantly she had the credibility, she had the sort of credibility back. Now, now the exact messaging, the exact sort of mm. science there, you know, uh, uh, we don't have that, we don't have mm. that kind of thing. But do we, uh, do we have enough to say climate change has caused death? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely yeah. we have that. Okay, do we have any more questions? Yeah. Can we have a mic down here? Hi, thank you for a very good talk. Um, I've worked in the NHS for over 30 years and um, it's come to me very recently that all the amazing care we provide and the fantastic research and WSI operations is meaningless if we have no food. And my organisation is about to launch a strategy that mentions nothing about sustainability other than sustaining its business. <laughs> I just wondered what you thought about that. What's your organisation? don't want to say that. Okay, fine. That's fine. Fair enough. Uh, it's an outstanding <laughs> local hospital. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> um, well, firstly, the NHS has a legal commitment to respond to this. It, it is bound by the Climate Change Act um, in, the way as every, in the same way as every other part of society and government is bound by the Climate Change Act. That brings it at least to net zero by 2050. The NHS itself, up at its most senior of sort of leadership levels, has started to say we don't think that's, that's anywhere near good enough. I, I suspect what we're going to start to see, and I think what we have seen already around the country, Newcastle Hospital, teaching hospitals, has done some really incredible, really impressive stuff. Um, there are going to be people that are going to move early. They're moving really early in Bristol. Um, there are going to be people that are going to be a little bit slower, but very, very quickly, this is going to become something that is just mainstreamed. It's just going to be corporatized within uh, sort of core business of NHS. We had a great conversation with Nice the other day about talking uh, about. Can I say what nice sorry, is? Um, about one of the uh, one of the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Um, it, it provides sort of clinical advice and guidance to to health professionals. Um, <sighs> It, along with a few other parts of the NHS, figure out roughly what uh, each disease and each treatment and each thing does and should cost the NHS. Um, every piece of activity that the NHS does, it figures out a monetary value attached to that. Um, and a lot of the activity-based funding that goes into different parts of the NHS are based off some of those calculations. The thing that we were talking about trying to start to do, and you know, God, if you, if you could mainstream something, you could mainstream it this way is trying to figure out as well as a financial cost what the environmental cost is out the other side. Um, it would completely revolutionize the, our ability to capture sort of data from, uh, from every single part of the NHS. Um, it goes 
orders of magnitude further than anything NICE had ever tried to do. Um, I think you're going to start to see a, a lot more of that over the next couple of years. So do you think we have time for those technical things? <laughs> because one of the things that worries me is yeah. that we're going to spend all this, the next 10 years working out a method to add carbon footprint into our pricing of drugs. Um, and how to carbon footprint drugs, rather than just making some shortcut rules. Yeah. What do you think about that? What are your shortcuts? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, Shut inhalers is an easy one, yeah? But the, sure. the, the, other, the other things, I don't know. But so, if, how, how, do we, how, do we, how do we do the time scales, given there are places we don't know that have the knowledge? Yeah. Yeah. It's... Um, one thing I know for sure is that research is going to move too slow. One thing I know for sure is that when it comes to, at least in the medical world, you know, research that happens today, it finds its way into clinical practice, or it finds its way into the mainstream literature 10, 15 years later, finds its way into clinical practice another 10, 15 years after that, um, and then it's properly evaluated and scaled up and spread out, you know, another 10 years after that. In the energy world, they tell me it's about the same. They tell me there's about a 40-year time lag between first publication of a new idea to sort of widespread deployment. And so on the timescales we're talking about, at least in its current form, a lot of the research that's done is just moving too slow. It's not to say it doesn't have a role, mm. but so, so I'm agreeing with you. I, I, I think when it comes to something like healthcare and what we hope to see out of some of this work from the NHS, you have to have both tracks going. You have to have something very, very early on that says, no, no, we're really serious about this. Demonstrate some early commitments, early wins, because there are low hanging fruit that we can take advantage of. The NHS can just start purchasing 100% renewable energy. It's allowed to do that. Um, it's going to start doing that, and that sort of early commitment, I think, is really important. Mm -hmm. But there are some things down the other end of this, 10, 15 years away, that are more complex. Uh, retrofitting buildings is complex. A couple of hundred hospitals in the NHS, they are all different. Um, there's no economy of scale that comes from the retrofitting that has to happen with sort of CHP and all sorts of things there, uh, combined heating and power uh, uh, there. And so getting that sort of pipeline right is right I, is difficult. Ultimately, you can move as fast as you can move, right? Um, and so for some sectors of the economy, we should be pushing really, really hard. For the NHS, it should make sure that first it is able to deliver high quality care. Mm. Good. Um, have you got the microphone over that corner? So should we do those two, one after the other? Yeah, do one first, then we'll answer it, and then we'll do the next one. Yeah. If I could just uh, add a follow on. Uh, thanks for practicing Newcastle, by the way. Uh, but I'd like to just talk more about Bristol. Yeah. Uh, actually, are you in a position to talk more about what you think they're doing? Because clearly they've recently announced their intention for net zero by 2030 for the city, um, and clearly the health part is a significant component of that. Um, I'd be interested in your perspective, and indeed, do you think they've uh, highlighted the, the better world that comes out of the other end by pushing on this? Mm. I, I probably don't know enough about it to talk with any you know, great uh, authority or whatever, if an Australian can talk about Bristol with any authority ever. Um, uh, my impression on the messaging is that there's a little bit more work to do in terms of understanding the health implications of both a lack of response and the health benefits of that response. Um, uh, we, as part of the work we're doing with the NHS, have just started reaching out to Jackie Daniels at Newcastle and then, um, and then to some of the people in Bristol to try to get a bit of their learning about why they haven't done that. Um, and it may be that we just didn't think about it. It may be that we just didn't sort of, you know, put it first and foremost because climate change still is an environmental problem primarily. But I, but I guess I'm, I guess I'm interested in sort of what the thinking is around that. Um, we have, we've got a consultation open at the moment, asking for input from um, people all around the country on how the NHS can hit net zero and when we think it should happen by. Um, it's open until the 22nd of March. Uh, the two parts of the country where we've seen the most responses from um, Bristol and London um, by, by a long way. And that's like the greener NHS thing, if people want to find it. That's, that's right, yeah, yeah greener NHS, I think yeah. you should probably find it. Yeah. I don't know the URL, okay. sorry. Should we do it? Okay. So in the UK, our carbon emissions in geographical terms have gone down about 40% since 1990. Well done, our consumption sir. emissions have gone up about 4%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How is the NHS looking to tackle scope three emissions from its supply chain? Is it doing anything on that? Yeah. Does, the, does the net zero targets even include that, even mention that? Because the UK's 2050 net zero commitment doesn't. They don't, yeah. yeah. Really, really good question. Uh, scope three emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three. Scope three emissions are the stuff that are sort of outside of your direct control. So they're the emissions that are in supply chains. Um, so if the NHS purchases gloves, 
um, those gloves have to come from somewhere. Um, at the moment, a lot of the gloves from the NHS, they come from Bangladesh. Um, and there are emissions in where they're produced, and there are emissions in getting them from, from there to the NHS. And so it has clearly, I agree, some responsibility in those emissions. But it is not the only person that has responsibility because it's not the only purchaser of those gloves. Lots of health systems around the world pr purchase those gloves. And so, and equally, it doesn't have complete control over those emissions. So it has responsibility, but not necessarily all of the mechanisms to engage with that. We, um, we have, fair enough, we have a expert panel that we've convened to help bound some of the decisions and discussions. So we're aware that fees and they're aware that they don't consider scope three emissions. Um, we put that panel together for the first time about a month ago and put everyone in the room. We had, uh, we had unanimous support that all of the work we're doing to think about the NHS's um, commitments had to include scope three emissions. What the hell is the point if you're not thinking about the thing that contributes the vast majority of the emissions? We're going to include that in all of our metrics, all of our targets, and all of our pathways. But we are also going to have to accept that we don't have complete control over that. And so what we're going to have to do is go and tap our friends in, or our old friends in Germany and France and other parts of the world, and talk to them about how we can engage in pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical procurement um, there. I think there are some really exciting ideas for the things that we could try to do around that, the sorts of things I have been hearing uh, sort of tossed around by, by different health systems around the world are things like, well, if you have a net zero target, when you're gonna purchase medicines, maybe you, maybe you say, listen, we're only gonna purchase medicine from someone that has an equal or better or equal or stronger um, commitment. We'll give you guys fair warning. We'll give everyone a couple of years to get up to speed. Um, uh, there are all sorts of things like that. So you can send some pretty powerful signals, but you do have to accept that at the end of the day, you may run into a situation where there's a pharmaceutical company that says, to hell with you, I'm the only person that produces this drug and you have no option but to purchase it from me. Mm -hmm. I don't think we're going to run into that in any enormous uh, case. But yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I think there's also stuff, you know, I work as a clinician, as a GP, and there's stuff you can do just about the efficiency of your use of stuff. So all our prescribing, all our use of stuff. And there's massive variation across the country. You know, I've started to look at the inhaler data, yeah. and there's different, different regions of the country use very different proportions of inhalers. Um, so that's, that's something we can do that will help the scope through. You, uh, you, you knew about the change in the GP contract? Yeah, I did. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but I, I'm not, what about I'm the I know, I know, I know. Yeah. What, about, what, about your not, what about your normal GP co colleagues? I, I, well, the ones in my practice do because I've emailed them about it. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, no, I suspect most have, don't have a clue. Yeah, it's really and wouldn't pay, it? wouldn't pay a lot of attention to it. It's so much detail. There's so much. I mean, that, that sort of takes me to another question I had, which was about the, the gap between the senior leadership in yeah, the healthcare yeah. system and the frontline staff and this pressure on um, uh, the time. You know, the, this time is a resource in, in the healthcare system. And if you want um, health professionals to do stuff on this, you have to somehow find a way to give them some time for it, mm. I think. And I don't know if you're hearing anything about um, any readiness to spend healthcare budget giving health professionals time to change practice. We have to invest in time, we have to invest in staff, we have to make sure that it's included in induction, we have to make sure that it's included in the quality improvement work that clinicians have to sort of or get to engage in. I, I think the real money is when you, when, you start to, when you start to hear a surgeon somewhere that says, I'm a good surgeon not because I was rude and abrasive to my patient as I you know, cut their appendix out of their leg or whatever. Um, <laughs> doesn't sound right, does it? Um, I'm a good... You need to do some more clinical yeah, work. Yeah, <laughs> or desperately not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't go near a patient. Either. I'm a good surgeon because, because, I, because I made this choice based right. on sort of the environmental considerations. When we start to build sort of climate change, the environmental sort of sustainability into what generates clinical kudos, that's where I think we'll see change. As to the specific money, um, this thing needs money, right? This is going to cost money to move this quickly. It's going to have benefits out the other side. I don't think that money should come from the health budget. Okay. I think that should come from outside of government. I think the NHS is strapped enough as it is, and there are going to be cost savings here, but there are going to be upfront capital investments, and those capital investments are going to have to come from outside of the NHS's existing budget. Yeah. Should we have a... Um, I had a question just kind of following on and of when you were talking about like gloves and that kind of supplies. I was wondering if you had any ideas or opinions on uh, extending that to like labs, research labs mm -hmm. who use also consume a lot of gloves, plastic, and what yeah kind of ideas would you have for the for carbon savings um, 
in that in that area, which is kind of also linked to uh, medicine, biomedical yeah. research. Uh, yeah. yeah. Labs, I think, are about. God, someone's going to correct me. Um, Oh, don't make up a number. I think it's about 6%. I think labs make up about 6% of the NHS footprint. I, I'm probably wrong, so I'm sorry if someone knows better. Um, uh, they're an incredibly important part of what that response looks like. Um, their emissions profile are partly in sort of single-use plastics, partly in some pretty sort of intensive um, materials, and that's going to be hard to shift. That's going to be really hard to shift. Um, partly in the fact that a lot of the machines and technology just kept on whirring around overnight when they don't necessarily need to be. Um, thankfully, we have at least as part of the work, and this has sort of turned into, we're talking a lot about healthcare, aren't we? Um, this has turned into, we have, uh, we have the Wellcome Trust um, uh, and their uh, executive director and their head of climate change sitting on this expert panel. One of the things that they're going to take on is exactly how labs need to shift some of that. And then, you know, if one, if one funder is going to start to move that and one funder has the ability to permission the rest of us to go and do that and spend some of our research money as we do that doing it um it's the welcome trust they're going to start giving us permission it's kind of ludicrous that this doesn't happen at the moment but permission to take the more expensive option if the more expensive option is lower carbon mm -hmm. um, at the moment we at the lancet countdown we're just doing that um uh, and waiting for someone to challenge us i think they have so far decided not to challenge us but um i hope sometime someone will and i think that's something that's a conversation obviously happening in universities about how the universities can lower their footprint with their labs mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions on the, the, sort of the other side of Nick's talk, the wider determinants of health, food, transport, all those sorts of things that we talked about? Yeah, should we go that side? We'll come to the middle in a moment. We'll come to the middle I next. hope it's sufficiently on that point. Uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about, as somebody who doesn't work in healthcare and isn't related uh, to that side of things at all, I see in the media uh, a kind of idea that maybe our country's mental health is worsening as a, as a general trend. And I wondered if you thought that the changing and increasing air pollution, particularly nitrogen oxides that are coming from the increase in diesel cars, could be impacting that in any way. I noticed in the chart um, that you had with the lines leading down uh, that air pollution was only linked to uh, heart and uh, physical things, and there's a mental health box that it wasn't linking to. Did you also notice that nothing linked to the mental health box? <laughs> we, we tried a version of that diagram where we linked things to the mental health box, but it linked to everything. And so, and so instead, we did a pretty unsatisfying thing, which is linked it to nothing. I don't know. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm aware, a couple of, aware of a couple of studies out there, some over on the west coast of the United States, one from a friend of mine um, uh, based in London at UCL, in fact, where all good research is... Um, conceptualist, um, that try to make a link between sort of mental ill health um, and, and air pollution. Um, they do an okay job of it. I don't think I'm yet fully convinced that we're, we're quite there. I think it's probably one of those spaces where you would say more research needed. Um, partly there's the mental sort of ill health side and the affective and anxiety related disorders, but there's also the question of sort of neurodegenerative disorders, so Alzheimer's. Um, and there again, I think probably we need, we need some more research, but it's certainly an interesting area that I've, that I've seen sort of start to spike up. What I do know is that the responses to decrease air pollution and to tackle climate change are good for mental health. I do know that green space is incredibly important in supporting sort of communities and well-being. I do know that physical activity, creating sort of communities and workplaces where we can get to, uh, you know, walking, cycling, that's incredibly good for well-being. And I do know the reason that mental health connects to all of those damn other boxes is because chronic disease in general is a pretty powerful risk factor for, for mental ill health. Um, and so to the extent that healthier diets, cleaner air, more physical activity is good for health, it's good for mental health. Great, thank you. Could we have the, Tony, could we have the microphone in the middle here? Should we pass it along to Anne. Am I answering the questions? I sometimes have a habit of talking around the question. I think people come back if you have an answer. Sometimes, yeah. okay. Is <laughs> Everyone has permission to ask a follow-up. Yeah, 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 please, to, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, my question really is, um, are there any ways that you see that the responses or the possible responses to the coronavirus emergency may also be helpful in stimulating the sort of responses that we need to the climate emergency? I mean, the only one that occurs to me, I mean, it's a pretty sort of depressing time, really, is just the sheer way at the over the last 
few days, the idea of video conferencing, instead of taking a long haul flight to an international conference, suddenly seems way more attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, I'm not sure if it's out yet, but there was a paper I had a look at a little, a few days ago. It's coming out, it's either out or it's coming out in Nature Communications. Um, China's seen a 25% reduction in its emissions profile since the start of, um, since the start of the epidemic slash pandemic slash. The Australian government, Scott Morrison, because he thinks he knows what he's talking about, has decided that it's a pandemic, despite the fact that everyone else has sort of refused to use that word so far. Um, 25% reduction is pretty, pretty enormous. It's not really for great reasons, though, is it? Um, uh, I Certainly, you would hope that we sort of start to see a little bit more of that. What I think I'm quite taken by is the different instances where the world can pull together in, as an emergency response. Now, whether or not we think we're seeing that in, re in response to coronavirus, I'm not quite sure. I don't think I have quite been as impressed as I want to be with how powerful a fake was the public health emergency of international concern and the international health regulations, sort of what used to be the WHO's most powerful lever. Um, but certainly I think there are, there are sort of lessons in emergency response that we can, that we can learn from there. Um, whether or not you start to see that sort of thing to, for climate change, who, who knows, I suspect not. But also climate change is a more complex problem than this, is an infinitely more complex problem than this. Um, and so, and, and it's not a short term response. The language that we had in 2009 around Copenhagen, you know, this is the moment, do or die, if we don't solve the problem here, you know, to hell with it, everything's, everything's sort of broken, um, I think is quite unhelpful. I think the language really probably needs to be about re-understanding, re-imagining, embracing a different relationship between sort of social and environmental sort of systems. Today, yes, and urgently, yes, but over the course of a century. Did we answer your question? I don't know, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Was there a question here? Yeah. Thanks. Uh, this is slightly reprising the mental health question, um, but maybe with a slightly different angle. Um, so could you talk about the impacts of the reality of climate change on people's mental health, like climate-related anxiety, or you mentioned li like livelihoods of farmers and so on? Mm. Uh, yeah, you just talk about that? <laughs> Another talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> Mate, I can talk about anything. <laughs> um, as long as it literally relates to one of those two issues, climate change, public health, and the links between the two. Um, I, I think those two things are slightly different. I'd like to disentangle the, the mental health effects that those farmers are experiencing. That is a loss of livelihood effect because the farm that used to, they used to depend on and their family and their community used to depend on is no longer doing the thing it used to do. And so there are all sorts of mental health impacts that come from loss of identity, et cetera. We have a pretty, um, a pretty good going sort of masculinity complex in Australia. Um, and, and you can imagine all sorts of, we see these enormous spikes in depression and in suicide that come mostly fairly violent suicide from men um, around, around drought in Australia. Um, that I think, that effect is, different from, uh, it sometimes gets called solastalgia, sometimes it gets called eco-anxiety, um, from, from that sort of concern that the world that we used to have is no longer there, that sort of sense of loss. Um, I have lots of debates with people about that second effect. Um, I have no doubts about the first effect. I have lots of discussions with people, usually in pubs, about that second effect. It's not a feeling I feel, and I get told, well, when we discuss that, um, sometimes I get told that maybe the reason I don't feel that way is because um, the best way to combat that is to go and do something about it. Um, the best way, and I've got a couple of colleagues that used to be physicians, emergency doctors in Canada, who say, I used to feel so depressed, I was so upset, I was so upset about the world that my daughters were growing up in, and then I stopped doing medicine and I started engaging in uh, the response to climate change, Courtney Howard. Um, uh, and then I started to feel better. And so I, I guess I don't know an enormous amount about the effect, but what I do know is that if you're feeling that way, the best way to combat that is to go and do something about it. Um, I, you, you must feel similarly. Like, you, you feel better when you're actively engaging, when you're... Yeah, yeah, I think... I think <laughs> Love it. Do I want to talk about my feelings on stage? Fine. But yes, um, yeah, yeah I, I think I feel a mix of the anxiety yeah. and the, like, I definitely feel better that I'm doing something about it and not just uh, letting it happen to me. Yeah. Um, and, but I do think that, that there might be some sort of uh, 
middle ground or some sort of category between the two things you were just talking about, yeah. the eco-anxiety and the I've lost my livelihood. And, and it's... Uh, uh, the, the people who feel like they might lose their livelihood. Sure. You know, and because and, I was yeah. talking to some uh, vet students, I think, yeah, I don't know if I saw some of them here tonight, about the, the future of the meat, uh, farming and meat industry. Mm, mm. Um, because often I just say, you know, me, reducing meat, red meat is good for you, it's, it's, um, it's good for the climate, it's something, it's a trend that we're seeing and that we sh it's good that you continue to see. But obviously, if you're, in, if you're in a community that's a farming community, and even if you're Sales aren't declining yet, or your you yep. know your industry is not collapsing. Uh, it can presumably be a huge amount of um, uh, distress that it might. That's right. Um, and which means beyond to that, so I think that conversation is interesting. I don't know if you w would be able to say something about your any interactions you've had with these sort of lobby groups, um, or I, I don't know, you don't have to get into the lo lobby group, yeah. but you know the the. The how you handle that conversation, because there's, there's, there's people who are just paid to lobby, but there's also a genuine concern among a, a huge group, whether it's the oil industry or the food industry, um, and, and they have um, well-being needs as well. So how do, how do you handle that? Yeah, I mean, two, two things you have to do, right? Firstly, you have to figure out if you're having an argument or a discussion in good faith or not. Mm. If you're having a discussion in good faith, then I think have that discussion in good faith. But um, it isn't just red meat. You, I mean, you said oil. You're right. There are countries around the world, Canada, whose entire existence depends on its continued revenue stream from oil. Um, Australia exports one third of the world's coal. If the world stopped buying coal tomorrow, Australia's economy would collapse and hundreds of thousands of people would die. It would be a terrible, terrible sort of health, health emergency. Um, and so we have to try and reconcile those two things. I'm not saying that we shouldn't stop buying coal overnight. I'm saying we probably should, but we have to recognize that there are gonna be effects of that out the other side. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about a just transition. Mm -hmm. um, it's so much easier said than it is to do though, hey? Um, because when you have an entire economy that has engineers and universities and you know, everything sort of set up to train people to dig stuff out of the ground and instead you're saying, no, 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 we want to train you to you know, whir things around in circles. Um, apparently they're very different things, says the Australian doctor. Um, I, I think we need to be really careful with that. I think we really need to approach it with a fair bit of compassion and concern. Um, because what you will do is suddenly you will turn that person who was interested in having a good faith argument and the discussion with you into someone that is just not interested because they see you as a fundamental threat or a thing you're talking about as a fundamental threat. That's where you engender pretty strong and powerful resistance. Um, I think we get it wrong a lot of the time, partly because we do the thing I said at the start, which is we have to be clearer, blunter, you know, mm -hmm. more direct with our communications. Uh, maybe sometimes you just have to read the room. I don't know. Anyone else have a question? Yeah, can we have the mic at the front here? Sorry, it's at the front here. Thanks. You got to, the, there are also lobby, like, I also have a lot of bad faith arguments, hey? Like, I, I get a heap of people who, uh, there's this one guy that, I think I've maybe told you about him. He's still at it. There's this one guy that keeps emailing. Um, he's now emailing Boris Johnson with me and CC, um, demanding that I <laughs> demanding that I be deported. Um, I'm not joking. <laughs> he's been doing it since David Cameron. Um, uh, so, so you get I get a lot of that sort of stuff. But then you also do get lobby groups that are mm. coming to say, oh yeah, yeah, we're really uh, the argument I'm most concerned about Bjorn Lomborg is. Uh, is not the person that says, I don't think climate change exists, or not the person that says it's not gonna be a problem, but the person that says it is gonna be a problem, it is bad, it's just number 47 on my list of global priorities. So I would rather, you know, and number one is deworming, or whatever Bjorn says it is at the moment, which is peculiar, because Bjorn does spend, for someone that's very concerned about deworming, he does spend about 95% of his time talking about the thing at number 47 on his list. It's that sort of, and again, that's a bad faith argument, right? That's someone that really is sort of, quite a dangerous, clever uh, response. That, that's the sort of denier I get kind of concerned about. Sorry, man, I just started rambling. To pivot completely, you yeah. mentioned that you see the NHS as kind of a leader in some sense. Where's your accent from? Uh, a mix of Australia and New Zealand. Okay. So you both right. managed to <laughs> really encourage me and then offend me right yeah. in the same sentence. I can do that, that's fine. <laughs> Um, you mentioned the NHS is this kind of leader yeah. in that what it does as a health service, a lot of the other countries will follow. And you saw that yeah. as a positive thing in terms of if the NHS decides to cut its carbon emissions, then hopefully other health systems would follow. Mm. Um, we see a lot of 
that happening informally in Australia and New Zealand because obviously a shed load of med students get educated here in the ways of the NHS and then end up in Australia and New Zealand. Do you see that being like a formal pathway to kind of spread the gospel of the NHS in some sense or... What's this educated, you mean the doctors educated in the UK that come to Australia? Yeah, or more, more generally kind of formalising that pathway of the NHS changing things and then that engendering change elsewhere um, because you're clearly pushing the like health motivates this problem better than other things. Why not formalise kind of the like NHS does push overseas kind of like, I don't know, just speak to that. Yeah, kind yeah, of thing yeah. More I, I, one little nuance of language you had just in, in there. I don't know if I necessarily would say health motivates things better than other arguments. I would just say that for different people, different arguments and different messages are important. We are all interested in, you know, we're all more than one issue, right? We're interested in different things. And so if we can understand that climate change affects us in lots of different ways, um, you maximize your chance. So health will do it for some people, but you know, not for others. GPs, James have been telling people to eat healthily for a very long time. I don't know with much success. No, well, telling people doesn't, isn't what changes things. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, I, I'm quite interested in that in that side of things. Um, there are NGOs out there in the world that do a bit of that, that try and take best practice and sort of internationalize it. There's a group called Healthcare Without Harm that does that does that a fair bit, mostly based in the US, um, but they, they try and do a lot of that. It, um, the NHS, as it launches its sort of greener NHS, uh, broader strategy, one of the things it is starting to do is recognize in a way that it hadn't before, weirdly, um, that the international that are seen as important, and that's because the NHS can play such a leadership role. So yeah, I'd love to see that sort of stuff. Mm. We do have a lot of discussion, and I'm never sure the answer. Can you replicate the success of the NHS here in other countries without the Climate Change Act? Or is the Climate Change Act essential? It better not be, because otherwise we're in a fair bit of trouble, because no one else is going down you know, mm. a path of legislation that powerful. Um, so I guess we have to find ways around it. I mean, to add, so um, on the, the sort of NHS global perspective. Yeah. Um, the Sustainable Development Unit, which is based here, and I, I worked for them previously, um, uh, d does do informal dialogue with yeah. lots of other countries. Mm -hmm. So I remember, this is years ago, you know, um, delegates coming from South Korea to talk to us mm. and um, stuff outreach to other South America, getting the, the, the documents from the Sustainable Development Unit translated into Spanish for South American countries, stuff like that. Um, and there's also a model, um, so NICE, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, that does the health technology appraisal and guidelines for the NHS. Um, they certainly used to, I'm assuming they still do, have, have a, a unit called NICE International, which mm. go, went out across the world, taking uh, leaders from the UK to countries like China and Colombia, um, promoting how they do, or not promoting, probably sharing how they do health technology appraisal. And so there are these mechanisms that exist already. I think they just need to be scaled and linked up much more to this green agenda. When you were talking to people from South Korea or wherever, uh, was it a was it an equivalent of the SEU or an equivalent within a DH sort of there, or was it a chief executive of a hospital? Or, uh, do you know what I mean? Like, because the thing I worry about is how do you find that landing point? The landing yeah. point in the UK is easier, but yeah, I. Th from memory, some of them were delegates from the departments of health. Yeah, right. You know, that, sort of, that sort of thing. Huh. Um, right, should we have one on the... That's okay. whereabouts, in, whereabouts in Australia? Sorry. Yeah, mate. <laughs> Can you tell from the accent? Uh, yeah, sort of, yeah. <laughs> okay. You can tell I'm not from Britain. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right, go for it, sorry. Um, I think uh, we all know that... Uh, the only way is um, making people uh, imagine a better world uh, without polluting, with uh, more greenery, with uh, um, better life. And I, I'm thinking, how is that possible? If the only thing they really want is a bigger car and mm. park that in front of the house and not, uh, not change their way to, to live. Mm. Good question, man. <laughs> Two responses, maybe. One of them's easier, the other one is probably impossible. Who knows? We'll find out. Um, the, f the first one is there are things we can do to decouple carbon from stuff. So there are things we can do to say, look, sure, you can keep having stuff. You can keep purchasing, acquiring stuff. We'll just decrease the carbon intensity of that stuff. Um, and that is going to have to be a big part of what we do. Um, it's already a part of what the sort of response looks like. Usually when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about, I don't know if you're talking about sort of the transport sector, you are talking roughly a third about 
have less journey less, roughly a third about if you are gonna travel, you know, use a, 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 use a different mode. Um, and then a third about it, sort of efficiency, about changing sort of fuel source. Um, that stuff's easy. The, the harder question is, is sort of, you know, sometimes when you dig deep enough, and usually I don't do this on stage, usually I sort of wait until I'm about two pints in, in at the pub, you, you, end up, you end up talking about uh, capitalism, you end up talking about materialism, you end up sort of realizing that some of this stuff uh, goes pretty deep. Um, I guess you're left with a few different options, right? Either you say, well, I want to confront that head on, um, but then you are taking on a pretty big thing, right? Like then suddenly you're not just taking on just CO2, you're taking on, you know, uh, an enormous response. And you now potentially the, the sort of answer is, well, you have to do that otherwise, otherwise, you know, the whole thing's folly. Um, and that's a discussion I don't think we have an answer to. The other, the other part of, um, the other part of the response, and, 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 and we certainly don't have an answer, is, well, you try and harness that. You try and say, well, if some of that is human nature or some of that is, you know, something that's built into a whole bunch of systems, let's try and harness some of those markets in the right direction. I can see a way that that works really, really well for power generation. I can see a way that that works really, really well for transport. The reason electric vehicles have reached cost parity with their non-electric counterparts is because the market has taken hold. Um, and governments have started to respond to put the infrastructure in place because there was a market to, to do so. I don't see that working very well with some of the hard to reach sectors. I don't see that working very well with agriculture where uh, uh, responsibility is disseminated. I don't see it working very well um, with uh, buildings. We need to retrofit. There are 29 million houses in this country. We need to retrofit all of those things and they've all got boilers and they all need to not have the same kind of boiler they have. And that probably has to happen in about a decade. I don't see a market taking place to deal with that. So this is an example where I definitely didn't answer the question, but I talked around a lot. <laughs> but I, I think there's probably room for optimism about, like, I, I don't think cultural shift needs to happen slowly necessarily. Sure. You know, you're saying it's about desire for this sort of stuff, and I feel like, I, I feel like if anything can change quickly, it's culture potentially. You know, and do, do, things do. don't change in a linear way. I don't but know. Come back, come back if you're, you're shaking your head. I don't know. How about that? Um, in the last like 14 years, since some um, PHE put out its Eat Well plate, like red meat consumption has declined in the United Kingdom by 8% just naturally. Most, and, and when you look at it from sort of kids age 15 to 25 or something like that, it's like double that. So it's mostly happening in younger generations. PHE sits there going like, what the hell is happening? How so on earth so did PHE that happen? So PHE is Public Health England. Um, you know, how on earth did that happen? It's a really rapid yeah. culture shift that is heading in the opposite direction to certainly my country. Mm. We consume five times the recommended dietary intake of red meat. So we need a bit more cultural interchange with Australia, do we? <laughs> Share our enlightened culture in the UK. Please leave us out of this. <laughs> yeah, so we can go anyway. Um, just sort of a question that perhaps goes back to the gentleman's question over my shoulder about the scope three um, yeah, carbon footprint, I suppose. And I hadn't heard that, that way of thinking about it before, but actually, you then, previously you said something about, um, you know, maybe we'd be better off spending more um, on a product which is less carbon intensive in the NHS. Um, but does that necessarily figure? Because if you spend more, then that money is then spent again by that organisation. Is there a scope for? Is there like another level of, you know, perhaps the execs are then spending their money on fancy cars. Right. Um, but necessarily, they're growing their companies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's um, a, famous, a famous engineer... Uh, it's called Je Jevons Paradox. Um, sometimes when you make an efficiency gain, you end up, uh, it's sort of most classically seen in cars, you make an efficiency gain in cars and they don't decrease in size or weight, they increase in size or weight. Um, and they increase their emissions because uh, instead, of, instead of sort of doing what you expected, people just say, oh, I'll just do more and bigger. Um, so you have to make, and you, we, we run into this in renewable energy all the time. Um, uh, you put a lot of lovely solar and wind in and that's really great, but it doesn't displace, right? New solar and new wind is only useful if it's displacing, um, if it's displacing fossil fuels. So I, I, I think we have to be pretty cautious about that. Um, what I, the way you overcome Jevons' paradox is you create a monopoly, um, is you create a strong enough price signal that says actually it's in your incentive, it's in your interest that no one is producing that other product. Um, and so if there is one health system that could manage to do that, God, it's the NHS. Um, but that's how, you, that's how you sort of beat that out, is you say, listen, we will pay just a little bit more 
if you can manage to uh, if you can manage to sort of demonstrate that you've decreased the emissions of this uh, drug. I don't know. Um, amoxicillin is a very very high carbon intensity drug. It, there's a bunch of ways you could pretty easily decrease the carbon intensity of that drug. Um, pay just a little bit more if you do that. If you get enough parts of Western Europe to jump on board with that, I think you will manage to overcome uh, that danger. Um, but you need to make sure that at the same time, and this is, it sort of goes back to what we were saying before, you are simultaneously being more efficient with the stuff and also being more efficient with the intensity of the stuff. Um, you need to do both at the same time. If you just do one or the other, you end up with Jevons paradox. Good. Shall we have one final question here and then we'll wrap up? Thank you. Sorry if we didn't have time for the question. So today's been a relatively good day for the environment in that the yeah. third runway at Heathrow has been cancelled. Uh, thanks, thanks to the courts. Yeah. Um, do you think the work that you're doing linking climate change and health effects is, has the potential to provide ammunition for challenges to um, environmentally destructive activities of various kinds on the grounds that they're going to kill people? I would hope so, right? I would, I would hope. Um, who was I talking to? There's a PhD student at um, the, the world's best university, University College London. You guys may have heard of it. Um, sorry. I actually don't care. I just like to sort of rib other, other universities. Um, it's the Australian in me. Um, who was looking at different instances where um, the courts have been useful in sort of uh, environmental precedents and then particularly in climate um, and trying to look at the role that health played there. What they sort of generally find is that you can start to sort of claim damages if you start to have enough doctors, epidemiologists, you start to have the data there that says, no, no, there's a real harm here. It's a real damage. That is much, much easier to do if we are talking about uh, pollution in uh, water supply, um, if we're talking about um, air pollution. Um, that gets much, much easier to do. I don't think we've quite seen the situation where um, it has had that same effect for climate change per se, but I do know that there's a couple of doctors, Howie Frumkin, went across to the US for a couple of, uh, a friend of ours went across for a couple of weeks um, to the court case over there that the kids were raising. I think it was, is it Ohio or Oklahoma? It was one of the O's, one of the states there. Um, and gave, gave testimony there as sort of a, a physician in response. Um, we need to be bolder. We also need to make sure we don't overstep too far, right? You could take two steps forward and 100 steps backwards if we go too far with some of this stuff. Um, but yeah, I would, I would hope that we get to that point. That the area I get, particularly interested in is around these detection and attribution studies. They're a new kind of study, new, been around for 10 years, but they're just getting, just getting sort of going where you were able to start to say, not only will climate change just generally increase the frequency and intensity of events in general, but you're able to say, you remember that heat wave, that heat wave was made 30% more likely as a result of the influence of anthropogenic climate change, or it lasted an extra day and a half, or, uh, or it was a little bit stronger than it otherwise would have been. If you can start to sort of make those kind of probabilistic um, uh, attributions, then I think you get, you get a lot closer there because we know that a death occurred as a result of that extreme weather event. Then all we need to do is get the climate science that are a, a little bit more firmed up. So I think that's all we've got time for tonight. Thank you all for joining us, joining us online and in the room. Um, for those in the room, we've got drinks outside so we can continue the conversation um, and Nick may be even more forthright. Um, outside. Um, but will you please join me and thank Nick for his talk. Thank you.